recorder. So today we're going to talk about imperative statements, semantics of imperative statements, and we want to introduce this notion of semantics. Imperative statements, you already know what they are. They're essentially, essentially the most important one is the assignment. Right? And it gives this view of the machine that with, with state, of a machine with state. And computation means that a machine goes from one state to the next state, from the current state to the next state, right? The state captures the, vari the values of all the variables, essentially the contents of the memory, right? If we have dynamically allocated memory, that will come into the stack of um, the execution that will come into, into the state as well, right? The entire contents of the memory. But simplistically speaking, it's just the values of the variables, right? And as you assign a variable, you essentially transition the machine from one state to another, right? Then the sugar around assignments is while loops and um, and decision statements, right? So that is essentially sugar. It's just a way of organizing the assignments. The assignments are what drives the computation. Um, so we talked about all these um, all these uh, statements in our first lecture on C, right? We had a review of assignments, if statements, while statements, do while statements, for loops, um, procedures, and a bit on recursion. Right? We're going to come back to procedures and recursion next time. Right? But what I would like you to take from this uh, lesson, from today's lesson, is the fact that we can view, we can model the execution of the machine, of the program. And the job of that is the semantics. Um, OK. So reminder, since we've done it in C, a reminder of statements, of imperative statements, this is a Python program. What's specific to Python? Uh, because we want to experience as many programming languages as possible. Um, blocks are defined by indentation, as opposed to blocks being defined by curly braces in C. Uh, so there is no need to terminate a line with semicolon. Uh, lines starting at this in the same column will belong to the same block. Line that are indented further away will be in a nested block. Okay, so here what we do is we assign two variables x and y. This is the GCD naive computation. Then notice the while statement. There's no need for brackets. It is terminated by a colon saying that a block will start on the next line. The block on the next line is indented. Everything that starts, at least in this column, in this column or further, will belong to the nested block of the while loop. All right? And uh, if will be similar, if has a condition, and then it is ended by a column, then we have, right, the block of the then branch of the if, which would be further indented. Right? Then we have the else, which notice that it will start on the same line, on the same column as the if as the if, actually I should be showing here, right? And then further indented is the block for the else branch, all right? Uh, and we're going to do a few examples in Python, and we're going to try to, whenever it's easy, we're going to try to switch between uh, C and Python um, uh, as much as we can, so you get to see both languages. Okay, so... We have assignments, okay? We have a while condition. The while, uh, we all have a while loop. The while loop has a while condition and a while body. Notice that the entire while body is indented uh, for about four spaces uh, as compared to the start of the while statement, all right? And then inside the while we have an if statement which has its own blocks. It has a then branch and it has an else branch, and the then branch and the else branch are both indented. Um, okay, so in general, it's very easy to program in Python. If you download the Python uh, environment, it comes with a, an integrated um, uh, environment, right? Uh, you just open a window, you type this program, and uh, when you type enter, 
So every time you type enter, right, the uh, interpreter will assume that you want to put more statements in the same block, right? So you type enter here on the same on the last line. You're gonna go to uh, the, the interpreter will try to give an opportunity to input more lines. But if you press enter a second time, right, the cursor will go to the first column, and then the uh, program will start executing and um, there will be no printout, of course. You have to inspect the values of x and y uh, uh, separately after that. But that's very simple. You just type x and you get the value of x. It's like a calculator. Um, so it's, it has a print eval, um, uh, sorry, uh, a, read print, uh, a read eval print uh, loop that, that works very nice. So remember one line. Uh, each line represents a statement, a indentation defines blocks, and now we move on to semantics, right? So we want to understand what, how can we, you, you know, the, 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 the thing is that um, a programming language does not need a computer to be useful. If I give you a Python program, or if I give you a C program, you can execute it, right? You don't need a computer to find out what the program is doing. If you see the assignment x equals x plus 1, you know what that means. If you see the while loop, while x less than 100, you know what that means. You could execute a program by hand, right? which means that the meaning of programs is independent of the computer. We should be able to assign meaning to programs without the computer interfering. All right? So this is the idea of semantics. We are trying to assign meaning to programs in a manner that is independent of the machine on which the program runs. All right? And how do we do that? What do we mean by meaning? Well, that's a very subjective concept, right? If you ask me a word that you don't know and I give you an explanation, right, of that word, you will understand my explanation only if you know all the words that I'm going to include in my explanation, right? So, essentially, assigning meaning is, whenever you have a concept that you don't understand, to translate it into possibly a set of concepts that you do understand, of, about which you know. So, in general, semantics is a translation process. We take this source language, C or Python, let's say, that we assume we don't understand, and we want to give meaning to this program, right, in a notation that we do understand, all right? Now, semantics was invented by mathematicians, and uh, typically this meaning will be a mathematical formula, and including sets, functions, relations, um, all right? And uh, it makes sense to the math mathematicians, right? The assumption is that they don't know the source language, but they know the mathematical notation that they assign as meaning to the language. So then, by reading the mathematical notation, they learn the language somehow, right? This is the underlying assumption. But we're going to take a different approach because we want to be more concerned with programming rather than with mathematical notation. So we're going to have as an example of semantics a compiler, which does what? Translates from the solo code language that we don't know into another language that we do know. And by providing this translation scheme, we in fact assign meaning to the original language, which we assumedly do not know, right? The target language is going to be the vanilla assembly language that we have learned, all right? Then we're going to invent a toy language, a very simple language that has just assignments, if statements, while loops. That's all. 
And we want to give meaning to that language. We got, want to define its semantics. Um, all right. And it's an important exercise. It, it goes down to the essence of what programming languages are. So let's look at the toy language that we want to consider. So in the entire program is going to be a statement. All right? And what kind of statements do, you, do we have? We were going to use a grammar, of course, to define this language. Right? A variable is assigned an expression. The first line defines, the first word defines an assignment. The second line defines the if statement with both L, then and else branches, right? So the first if has two branches. The second if on the third line has only one branch, has only the then branch. Then we have a while statement, while Boolean expression, and because we're going to implement this in prologue, we're going to be forced to use a connective between the condition and the body. We can't do the C syntax, right? So we're going to use the keyword do, which is not uncommon. Pascal, for instance, uses the keyword do for while loops as well. And uh, for the very same reason, we will have the then keyword for the if statement. Then we have compound statements, right? So curly brace statement, closed curly brace. We have sequences of statements, statement one, semicolon, sem uh, statement two. And we have single statements terminated by semicolon in the form statement semicolon. Now this imposes a few restrictions on the language. This imposes a few restrictions on, on, the, on the language, all right? So uh, for instance, if we want to write uh, a statement that uh, that has a curly brace. Let's see how this one works. Okay, so if we want to write a cur statement that starts with a curly brace, ends with a closed curly brace, and we start here another statement, right? So those are curly braces. I'm not sure how recognizable they are. So this would be okay in C, right? Some statements here, some statements here. But in our toy language, after the closed curly brace, we need a semicolon. So remember that. All right? So it's a very common oversight. Is this clear? So the language imposes that. Why? Why did they go to the. Uh, all right, if I want to get out of here. All right, so the language imposes that right here, right, because of this. We have a statement. So this statement is something that is begins with curly brace and ends with curly brace. And after the statement, if I want to start another statement, there must be a semicolon. All right. Now, in the, at the vanilla assembly language level, well, we already kind of know what's happening there, right? In the first lecture or the second lecture, we've discussed this translation scheme from full-fledged C into vanilla assembly language skeletons, which were still C, C statements, but you know, of much lower level. So, we, so we've seen, for instance, how a while is translated into something that has an if statement at the top and some labels and some go-to statements, right? So we're going to pretty much take advantage of that. Uh, we are not looking for the most efficient vol code. So if you're going to come after that and say, oh, but this is so inefficient, how can we execute this? We don't care. We're looking for correctness right now. We're looking for the translation being correct. We're looking for the correct semantics. We're going to need a stack for evaluating expressions, right? One aspect that we need to implement is evaluating expressions. We have seen in one of the tutorials how we can use a stack-based virtual machine to evaluate expressions, and we're going to have a simulation of that in our compiler. And to keep track of the stack, we're going to have a new register. So. Initially, we introduced for val only six registers, six variables that would be regis uh, registers, EAX, EBX, ECX, 
EDX, uh, ESI, EDI. So we're going to, and I was telling sort of at that, uh, telling you at that, that time that uh, we're going to need two more, right? So one we get to see today, this ESP, which is going to be the stack register. We're going to initialize it with the top of the memory, with the 10,000 value, with a value of 10,000, right? And we're going to have stack growing downwards and heap growing upwards as it is traditional in, uh, you've learned that from operating systems, right? In the, or with the memory organization of processes. It's not an important feature, right? We just use it because of the tradition. We could have a stack growing upwards and being placed anywhere else in memory. It doesn't really matter. Now, we're going to have pushes and pops, all right? So this would be the push operation, two instructions, right? We decrease the register and then the ESP register, which is the stack pointer, right? And then we write an integer in there, right, at that location. And we can pop from the stack, right? We first retrieve the value from the top of the stack, and then we increment the stack by four elements. Right, so this should be relatively straightforward. All right. Now, before we go into our compiler, let's uh, go through the several types of semantics that are usual. We're not doing any of those, but just for you to be informed, to have that information. The most typical, the most common type of semantics is the operational semantics. It translates the program into a transition relation. It has a description of what the state is, and it has a relation that says from each state, what would be the next state. When we have the notion of state, it, the, that will be the values of the variables plus the program counter, right? So if we have a specific value of the program counter, we will be pointing at a specific instruction. So it's very clear that from a specific instruction, we can go to the end of that instruction. That would be the next state. But it has a very nice and, and uh, uh, relatively simple, simple, I would say, a mechanism, ma mathematical mechanism for, for, for specifying that. It is very useful in uh, implementing interpreters. So if we have a um, operational semantics, it is also specified as rules. We can translate that into prolog rules and we have an interpreter almost immediately, okay? There are two types of operational semantics, small step and big step. Small step semantics goes one instruction only one instruction, right? Sort of, right? And, and uh, so, for instance, when we have a while statement and we're just outside at the top of the while, right? Just outside, just, just, just before entering the while. With this small step semantics, the next state would be just inside the while, right? So, because that's how the execution goes, right? If you're just above the while statement, and you perform one step execution. If you were in the debugger and you press next, you go right beneath the while condition. That would be the next step. But with a big step semantics, the next state for a while statement is, the, is right outside at the bottom of the while. It has this way of assembling, um, of assembling um, uh, statements together and hiding away the intermediate state. So you just see the state before the beginning of the full statement and the state right after the, the full statement. So that's the difference between small step and big step. And maybe you just keep it in your mind at some later point. There used to be a course on semantics, but there weren't that many takers, so it has been uh, discontinued. Uh, but I think there are several courses that would, um, would take advantage of these notions. Denotational semantics is a translation of a program into a function. So we see the program as a, as, a, as a state transformer. You give me the input state, and I have a function that gives you back 
the output state. Alright, so we can always express the input, the output state as a function of the input. Denotational semantics is typically expressed in lambda calculus, and you would be able, it's not expressed as rules, and if you have the denotational semantics of some language, you would be able to implement an interpreter in what language do you think? What language? Of the languages you know, what is the closest to the lambda calculus? Lisp, very good. And which one, which variant of Lisp have you learned? Scheme, right? So in Scheme, you would be able to in, uh, uh, implement an interpreter relatively easily once you have the denotational semantics equations, right? So that would be a set of equations defining a function. Collecting semantics, very useful in uh, program analysis. It uh, defines, the, the semantics is the set of states, the exact set of states that may occur at a program point. So it's a projection of um, uh, states at every program point, right? So you can say, well, at this program point, I can have only values of x that are less than 1 and values of y that are greater than 100. Right? So if you manage to compute that, and if you manage to get this information at each program point, what would be the, the, uh, the range of values for variables uh, at, at that program point, then you would have a collecting semantics. Axiomatic semantics. Uh, has anyone taken logic, CS3234? How many? One. Just one. Oh, you dropped it. <laughs> Before whore logic or after whore logic? Before whore logic. All right, so axiomatic semantics is, is it comes from logic. And uh, I can't use this. I'm not sure how I can use this. Anyway, so it has to do with whore logic, which is a topic discussed in, uh, in, in logic, in CS3234. Um, it has uh, to do with proving correctness of programs, right, with program proofs. And uh, in general, you know, uh, when people break new ground in semantics, what they do is they use a combination of the above. And we're going to use, uh, in fact, I think, I think we're closest to the denotational semantics, though we're going to be using rules. So we, you can say that we have a combination between the operational semantics and the denotational, the denotational semantics in our approach. What we want, in our case, is to attach a piece, a, a, a vol skeleton, to every state statement of the um, of the toy language. So let's go to the semantics of the toy language. We're going to express it as reasoning rules. We have learned that for a reason, exactly to be able to express the semantics. That's going to be the crux of the use of reasoning rules. Uh, you are, if you're going to take high-level courses, five or six-level courses related to programming languages, it's very likely that you're going to see these reasoning rules again. Uh, the context is an environment. The environment maps a variable name to its address. So not its value, but rather its address. Right? You're thinking that, as in every programming language, variables are stored somewhere in memory. There is such a notion as the address of a, um, a variable, so that's what the environment is keeping track of. Uh, we assume for the time being, though when we implement it in Prolog, we're not going to keep to that assumption, but we assume for the time being that it already contains all the variables in all the programs, right? All the variables already have an address. We have infinite memory, and for any variable we might encounter, we already have an address. But later, of course, that's not a, that's not a realistic assumption if we want to implement something in, in real life. So we're going to drop that, and we're going to build our environment dynamically. Um, and as before, each reasoning rule handles one production of the grammar. Okay, so we're going to go through all the rules of the grammar. And uh, what we have hidden, in fact, from the grammar, 
if we go back here, we're saying that Boolean expressions are, right, and we're giving a set of Boolean expressions, and the expressions are as before. So we have these expressions here, right? These expressions here, they're the same as before. We have seen this grammar before, right? So we don't add it here, but we still need to evaluate all the expressions. So we're going to do that. So first of all, let's look at the semantics of expressions. The first rule, what's the simplest expression? A constant, right? How did we handle a constant in the tutorial when we were doing uh, evaluation in the stack-based virtual machine? We would push the constant on the stack, right? We do the same here. So whenever we encounter a constant, we push it on the stack. So we have this instruction, this set of instructions, right? This is the semantics of a constant. This is the val code that represents the semantics of a constant. What if we have a variable? We push the variable, we push the value of the variable, not the variable, we push the value of the variable on the on the stack, right? But when we push the value of the variable on the stack, we have to do it in two steps. We have to load the value of the variable from its address into a temporary register, and then we can push that register. So in the semantics of the variable, we're gonna, uh, we're gonna make it to be this set of three instructions. Now in this notation here, when I write m index, this ev represents the address of the variable v taken from the environment. So I'm going to generate a string, but in the middle of that string, I'm going to insert the address of the variable v by retrieving it from the environment. Third line, we may have this expression, expression one operator, expression two, where the operator may be either plus or minus or multiplication or division, right? And we're assuming that the meaning, the semantics of E1 is the code C1, and the semantics of E2 is the code C2, right? So the semantics of E1, operator E2, is gonna be the following. I take the code C1, I concatenate it with code C2. Remember that C1, C2 are essentially strings, right? So I'm gonna put, I'm gonna write out the string for C1. I'm gonna write out the string for C2. And then I'm gonna write the following string. And remember what happens with the code. What's the assumption for a, uh, the code for a specific expression? After executing it, what do we have? Louder. It has where it is that return value. Where is it stored? In the stack, right? So the top of stack will have the return value of C1, right? So essentially, think now that this is a string, but this, is, this string represents a val program. If I execute C1, the value of E1 is going to be in the stack. Then I execute C2, the value of C2 will be placed in the stack on top of the value of C1. So now what can I do? I can pop two values, perform the operation, and push the result back, right? So this is what we do. We pop the first value, which is the second operand. It's the value for C2, for E2. So ECX will have the value for E2. We pop EX, which is the value for E1. We perform the operation in here and we push the result back. So the result of the current expression will always reside at the top of the stack, okay? And semantics for expressions, ta-da, right? Easy peasy. Assignments. Well, the assignment is of the form variable is assigned expression, right? So now we assume that the semantics of the expression is already C. 
right? So the, the semantics of the uh, assignment is going to be what? I'm going to put down, I'm going to write down the code evaluating E. And after executing this C, the result should be at the top of the stack, right? So I'm going to take it from there and put it in the variable. But not in the variable, at the address where the variable should be stored as specified by the environment, right? So execute C. The result is in the top of the stack. I'm popping, I'm, I'm popping the result of C, the result of E, that is, right? ECX after the pop will contain the value of E. And then I'm going to store it at the memory address that pertains to V, right? That, at that address, we're going to just store ECX, which contains the value of E. So this is the semantics of the assignment, right? Clear? Semantics of if statement. We're going to be using the skeleton that we learned in the second lecture. So, how does the if statement look like? We're going to have if. So, E1 operator E2, where this operator is one of the relational operators that are given here, right? Then S1, else S2. This is what we're looking for. And we're assuming that the semantics of E1 is C1, the semantics of E2 is C2, the semantics of S1 is C3, the semantics of S2 is C4. So we're going to do what? First of all, we want to know the value of the Boolean condition, right? So we're going to write down the code for C1, write down the code for C2. When they are executed, I'm going to have on the stack the result of E1 and E2. So let's go and compare them. We pop them. We pop the both of them, and we're going to perform this if statement that is allowed in val, right? The result of uh, E1, relational operator, result of E2. And if it's true, we should execute the then branch. The then branch is implemented by C3. Otherwise, we should be executing the else branch. The else branch is executed by C4. So we're going to play with a few labels here, right? So if this is true, I should go to L then. I'm going to put L then a little bit below. And right below L then, I'm going to put C3, which is the code for the then branch. If the if statement, the if condition here is false, then I should be executing the else branch. So right beneath the if, I'm going to put the code corresponding to the else branch. And after the execution of C4, I should be skipping the then branch that I have written below, right? So I am, I'm going to put a jump there to a label that is placed at the end of the if. Okay? Is this clear? Is it clear how the skeleton Right, the skeleton is all the brown lines. The placeholders are all the blue, blue, blue formulas, right? Blue symbols. Yes? No, we're going to see another rule for that. Okay? All right. So. Now the, the while rule. Actually, actually, uh, I, I'm not sure I'm giving the if rule uh, for a single one, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to be discussing it in a prologue code. Um, but now that you, you're seeing this one, right, you're seeing the if rule for, for two branches, I'm pretty sure you can kind of come up with an if rule for uh, one branch, with one branch. All right, so let's look at the while statement. While statement should look like this. While E1, relational operator E2, do S, right? And we're assuming that semantics of E1 is C1, semantics of E2 is C2, semantics of S is C3. So then we're going to do what? Well, first we need to evaluate um, C1 and C2, right? Which are the values, which will compute the values of expressions of E1 and E2. Then we're going to do as before. We pop the value of C2. We pop the value of C1. We perform an if. And if 
d if is if the condition here is true we should go and execute the while body so we're going to invent a label and place a label at the top of the while body otherwise if we're not able to if the condition is false we should get out of the while so we execute this go to statement that takes us right outside of the while and you notice here that right outside i have placed this and while label right so if the condition is false we're going to skip right out now we're going to execute the while body so we put the while body label here all right and then we execute c3 which represents the code is the semantics of the while body and at the bottom of the while we go and repeat we go to the top l while is at the top of the while right so this go to has as target this label is this clear okay we're almost done we are done I should I, what I don't have oops important I should have the sequence I, I forgot to write the rule for the sequence so anyway the rules are implemented in a little compiler so we're going to look at the rules everything that was missing from the formal rules are going to be implemented in the prolog rules um, right uh, so let's get get down to it it's a really fun application you can play with it it works uh, the code is there um, so we want to compile expressions right when we compile expressions one important aspect is we can't have this all-knowing environment right we can't have an environment that will give me back the address of every uh, variable whenever I need it right so every time we encounter a new variable we have to allocate space for it we're going to start allocation from zero and every time we encounter a new variable we're going to allocate four bytes for it so we're going to get, go four bytes further all right because of this because of this right the environment is not constant the environment changes so we're going to have each role is going to have two environments the environments before compiling that expression and the environment after compiling the given expression right because new uh, identifiers may have been encountered throughout the expression and they have been added to the environment right so the environment at the out uh, after the compilation is going to be a bit larger um, for reasons of efficiency we're going to keep track of the top of allocated memory actually that's a bit of a lie it's not quite the top of the allocated memory t that you see here is the first unused memory location now that's a bit redundant because i can always work out the address of the first unused memory location by counting how many mappings i have how many variables i have in my environment right i have four variables clearly the next the next three address is going to be at index 16. very clear right but if i keep track of it explicitly it's more efficient to allocate because i don't have to scan the entire environment to find out where the next address is so even though this t can be obtained from e we keep explicitly track of t because every time i need to allocate my t is going to be my address for my current variable that is being defined and the the the, the t out the output of that t the t after the compilation has to just move by four bytes so that's a constant time operation whereas if i were to retrieve t by just going through the entire environment that would take all of n times where n is the size of the environment so we just want to make things a bit more efficient now if we compile an integer the k here is an integer there is no new variable being declared so the environment in is the same as the environment out and the top in is the same as top out there's not going to be any variable encountered right because it's a constant 
And what do we do? So we notice the K. We just write out. Notice what we do here. We just write out what we had on the rules. So if I go back to the rules, right? This string that you see here in brown is exactly what we're writing out. Now, we want to be a bit more helpful. So we're going to be adding a comment. In our generated code, we're going to try to explain what we're doing. So we're saying here that we're pushing the constant k. Right? So when it's gonna when it, when you're gonna see this in the C code, this is gonna look like a comment. Right? So we're trying to be a bit more verbose. What if we have a variable? Well, if we have a variable, this variable might be completely new. So my environment in is definitely not going, uh, not sure to be the same as the environment out. I have to use two separate variables, and of course, the top may be different. Now, a variable is just an atom, so we're going to identify identifiers just as atoms. And if V is already defined, then this member will already bind this address variable to the actual address of V, right? So that's the easy scenario. I perform this member, and I get a binding for this address, so I know where V is allocated, right? In that case, V is, a, uh, v is not a new variable, which means that the environment, the output environment should be the same as the input environment. We're not, we haven't found anything new, so we're not adding anything to the environment. And conse consequently, T out should be the same as T in. But if this member fails, then we should expand the output environment to contain, right, to contain the input environment. Everything that was in the input environment should also be in the output environment, plus a binding for variable V. What should be the address of V? The first unused address which is T in, right? Now we have occupied T in and the following four bytes. So T out, which is going to be the first unused memory address after compilation, should be T in plus four. Okay, so this part of the code right here, let me have another attempt at Right, so this part right here deals with the possibility of new variables. Right, so checks whether a new variable is being declared, and if it's a new variable, it's not being declared, we're not declaring variables, right? Whenever we encounter new identifiers that we haven't seen before, we just allocate them. That's how we react here, all right? So if we encounter a new variable, we allocate. If not, we just use whatever we have there already. All right. And then, since now we have, we are guaranteed to have an address for V. So once we reach this point, when, once we reach this right, uh, right um, um, statement, we have an address for V, either old one or newly allocated one, at this point in the execution of the Prolog program, we have an address for V. So we can write the code for V, which was pushing the value of that variable on the stack, right? So we're going to write the code. And look how we write the code. We write up to the point where we have to retrieve the address from the environment. Then in a separate statement, we'll write the address. Then we write the rest, okay? So you should see this as ECX equals star in star address M square bracket number, which would be four or eight, right? Close bracket ESP minus equal four, right? So again, here we're gonna to try to be a bit friendly and say what we're doing, we're pushing variable V, right? We're gonna add it as a comma. And everything continues in the same way. Right? If we have an expression, O should be the operator, 
we compile recursively A, right? And the environment N is EN, and it will produce an environment E auxiliary, right? And the same here, T and T auxiliary. And when we compile B, because while compiling A, we might have encountered new variables, right? While compiling B, we're going to use whatever was the output of A. So this E auxiliary where is going to be uh, the input environment for, for B. We're going to get an E out and the same for T, T auxiliary to T out. Then we write all the code, the same code that was written in the rule. Which rule? The rule, this one. This one right here, right? So all the brown part here, you're going to see it written in the right line statements right here, right? And of course, when we have to write the operator, we're going to write whatever operator we had here. Is it clear? More or less, huh? Assignment. So for assignment, this V that we have here is possibly a new variable, right? So what do we do? We compile recursively E. We deal with the fact that V may be a new variable. So if it's not new, we just use the old address. If it is new, we allocate a new address. It's exactly the same code as you have seen uh, previously in handling of handling a variable as an expression and then we have the brown code for the assignment rule right here okay so at this point um, we can actually test the compiler right we already have enough to test the compiler so let's say we have this assignment x equals y plus 2 Right? Initial environment is empty. We're going to have some output environment. Right? And uh, we're going to have the initial top of memory is zero. We're going to have some output top. And we don't care about labels. So we're going to use uh, uh, one thing I forgot to tell you, right? Whenever we encounter those labels in if and while statements, for each if and while statement, the labels have to be new. We can't reuse the same name. So we can't have L while everywhere. We're going to have, need to have L while 1 for the first while statement, L while 2 for a second while statement. So we're going to use these arguments for generating new labels. But the assignment doesn't need new labels, so we don't really care about them right now. All right, so this is the generated code. So starting on the second line, this is the generated code, right, for the assignment. So that's something that I can cut and paste into an exec function and compile it in C and execute the assignment. All right, notice that the environment has encountered the variables x and y. So x and y are added here with the corresponding mappings. x is 4, y is 0. And the top, the current top of memory is 8. Rule for if statement. So the if statement has the, had the most brown number of brown lines. So we're going to follow exactly the same thing, right? We're going to decompose the expression B. Look, that there's a B here. Into operator, operand 1 and operand 2. And now we're going to have to generate labels. So this is a number that is increased by every label inst instruction that uses labels, right? So we get to an if, we're going to use as labels ln plus 1, right? So then we append this value to the every label, right? So this will make it L while L if 1, L then 1, L end if 1, as opposed to, right, for the first if statement, as opposed to L then 2, L end if 2 for the second if statement, right? Each if statement will get its 
own suffix so that all the labels are different. So uh, we decompose. We uh, notice the following thing that in prolog, this is the not equal sign. In C, this is the not equal sign, right? So we have to be careful and translate. So if we have the toy language negation, we have to translate it into C negation. All the other operators are the same. So we can just uh, uh, maintain that. We compile recursively X. We compile recursively Y, right? We write some of the brown lines that were that appeared in the rule, right? Um, then we compile S2, and then later we're going to compile S1. Notice at how we generate the labels, right? We say go to end if, and immediately after end if, with, the, with no space, we're going to write this number. This number is going to get, make this L, L end if uh, um, label unique. And then we terminate the line. Okay? And the same happens here. Here we generate L and diff, and again we append this number with no space, right? So the name of the label is going to be new every time because every time we're going to employ new numbers. When I go from L in to L out, L out is going to be L in plus one. Somewhere that should be reflected. Oh, yes, so LA will be used as an auxiliary here. I need two auxiliaries, right? So this is L auxiliary one, which I use as input here. Yeah, very good. <laughs> For a minute, I thought the code was wrong. So I use it as an input here. I get as output L auxiliary 2, which I use for as input here. And I get as output L out, which is the final output uh, uh, um, uh, label number, right? So that's another important thing. You see that um, we have this sequencing of values. It's not just for labels. It's also for environment, right? Environment in goes into environment auxiliary 1. Right, E in goes into environment auxiliary one. Environment auxiliary one goes into environment auxiliary two. Environment auxiliary two goes to, into environment auxiliary three. Environment auxiliary three goes into E out. Right? So, because this compilation is sequenced and we have this input output uh, uh, entities, right, like environments, if uh, the compilation of X has added new variables, those new bindings have to be used during the compilation of Y. So I can't ignore them. Whatever gets as output here has to be used as, out, as input in here. OK? So that's a general principle. Uh, an if example, right? So we have an if statement, and we can compile it already, right? So this is the code up to here. Notice that all the labels have a zero. And if we were to compile two if statements, the first if statement will have zero terminated labels. The next if statement will have one terminated labels, right? Labels terminated with one. All right. While, similar, right? So we have to write all the brown stuff. Everywhere where you see a right, it's the brown stuff. Everywhere where you see a C1, C2, or S1, S2, it's a recursive compilation, right? So our while looks like this, while B do S, but B is relational operator between X and Y. So we have to recursively compile X, recursively compile while, uh, Y. At the top of the while, we have to put a label, right? So X, Y. Then we have to write some of the brown code, essentially popping the values, performing the relational operator. So you see this is popping the popping a value from the stack, which is from for the second expression. This is popping another value from the stack, which is for the first expression, right? 
I have the if statement, but in the middle of the if statement, I have to put whatever relational operator I have found, right? And I have to invent this la this label. This is L while body, but I will have to append this L in to make it unique. And more of the brown stuff, and then we compile S, right? S, which is the body of the while, is compiled here, right? At the end of the body, we repeat. Go to while will be the repetition, all right? And then at the very end, we put the label that allows the exit from the while, right? So this will be another label. So we have a little example here as well. You may take a look and be sure. So we have x, y. Uh, now you're going to come at me and say, well, this is so inefficient, right? Because when we're, we're, we're computing x less than y, what are we doing? Well, we're pushing x on the stack. We're pushing y on the stack. We're popping y from the stack. We're popping x from the stack, right? So totally redundant, because the, I could have loaded EAX from X directly. I could have loaded ECX from X directly, right? Well, a serious compiler will not generate this kind of code, right? But remember, we're just looking for correctness right now. And we want something that is suitable for second year students. There's a module called compiler design. Um, go there if you want to find out how to make these four lines into two. Uh, all right, we generate the if. Um, if this is true, we want to go to the while body, which is here. And otherwise, we want to exit. We, we execute this, and the label is here right at the bottom. OK? There's the while body, which is x equals x plus 1. So what do we do? We push x, we push 1, and notice the comments that are being generated, right? Push x, push 1, um, then we pop x, we pop 1, we perform the operation here, so you notice that the plus has been generated correctly, and then we push the result of the plus, and notice the comment here that is um, reminding us of that. Then we're going to do that, we just pushed it, we're going to pop it back in order to uh, write it into x, because what we want to do is write into x here, right? So the address of x is 0, as shown in this environment right here. x was encountered at some point and allocated, so x is 0, and we push it back. So you see there's a lot of pushes and pops, most of which are kind of redundant. Nevertheless, they make our program run correctly, and they make the compiler relatively easy to understand. Okay? So if I wanted to generate more uh, efficient code, I would have to make it more hairy, so it would be less easy. The rest of the rules. So what I didn't, I, what I should have shown probably in the uh, in the reasoning rules, and I haven't. Sorry for that. But it's quite easy to understand here. Is the sequencing, right? So statement S1, semicolon statement S2, sequence statements. Okay. So. Uh, uh, the important aspect here is that whatever is coming out as output from compilation of S1 needs to be used as input in the compilation of S2, right? So when we compile S1, the environment in may be expanded to environment auxiliary. So then when I compile S2, environment auxiliary is used as input because throughout S2, I want to take advantage of all the variables that were encountered during the compilation of S1, right? So E auxiliary has to be used as input here, and only then we produce the environment output, which is the output of the entire statement. And it's the same with T in and T out. T in is transformed into T auxiliary. T auxiliary is transformed into T out. L in is com com uh, transformed into L auxiliary. L auxiliary is transformed into L out. This is a very important principle. And if you want, uh, for instance, if you want to compile uh, to add break and continue, if you want to add procedures, uh, you're going to have more and more input and output variables, which are going to be exact, used in exactly the same way. Right? Whatever 
I put as input in the first, in the compi compilation of S1, will produce some auxiliary which has to be used as input into the compilation of S2. Compile S, um, when I have a, se a semicolon here, this semicolon means nothing, essentially. So the only thing we do is strip it off, right? So the compilation of S with a semicolon is the same as the compilation of S without a semicolon. And also the compilation of S with uh, braces, semantically speaking, means nothing. It means something to the syntax analyzer, but when we reach the compiler, we'll pass the syntax analyzer. Prolog already has been grouping the statements properly. So a statement with braces is the same. The compilation of the same statement with braces is the same as the compilation without braces. So that's pretty, pretty much it. This is pretty much the compiler. And uh, what we would like to do is be self-contained. So we want to generate a full C program, right? So inside here, we're going to compile our toy program. This is the line, right? But what we want is to put that code into an exec to declare all the global variables to generate a main that will output all the local variables, all the variables that we have declared in our toy program, right? So then what we get is a program that we can cop copy and paste into a, um, a C compiler, into a C IDE, compile it and run it and see our toy program running. Okay, so everything is there. What we're doing is uh, obviously we're generating a main, we're initializing uh, the register ESP, we're calling exec. After exec, we want to print out every single variable that was encountered. So this predicate output vars will take care of that. For every binding that we have in our environment, we add a print, printing out which variable is being printed and its expression, which is some memory address. All right, so example. This is the example that we have seen in the beginning as a Python program. Now it is a toy language program. Computes the GCD of two numbers, which are 144 and 60 there. And this is the output that our compiler is generating. Okay? So um, now if you look carefully, you can recognize every piece of code that was added there, right? So let's, let's try. So you see, we have push 144 here. We have push 60. Um, we have a pop X, right? So, so the first instruction, remember, is X equals 144. So we have a push 144, we have a pop X. That will... Um, implement the assignment. We have a push 60, we have a pop Y. So that also will, um, will implement the assignment of Y to 60. We have the top of the while loop, right? In the while loop we have if X is not equal to Y, right? So what are we going to do? We we'll push X, we push Y, we pop X, we pop Y, <laughs> And we test the values of x and y. Well, we pop the value of x, we pop the value of y. They're in registers EX and ECX. We test. If this test is true, we should go to the while body, which starts here. Otherwise, otherwise, we should exit the loop. The loop exit is right here. Okay? And uh, if we start the while body, then we're going to do uh, the if, right? If x is less than y. So we're going to push x, push y, pop the value of x, pop the value of y, compare them, right? And we're going to, on the branches, we have two assignments. So L then 1 here was going to be one assignment. We, we push x, we push, we push y, we push x. We compute the, the, we pop them. We compute their difference. So here the difference is computed. Here, the result is pushed. Then, 
it is popped back into y, which is the destination of the assignment, right? We have y equals y minus x. So this is the then branch. The else branch is right underneath the if assignment. So this is the if statement. The if is here, so the then branch starts here. So we push x, we push y, we pop the value of y, we pop the value of x, we perform the subtraction, all right, and we push the result of minus into on the stack and we pop it into x and in this way we complete the assignment x is x minus y right um, okay and uh, that's it at the end of the if this is the end of the if we simply repeat go to while zero which is the top of the while loops body so we do the test again and um, this is a program that can be run and will output x equals 12, y equals 12. That you can try on your own. Any questions so far? So what have we learned? The most important lesson that we learned so far is compositionality. Small components are combined together to form bigger components. Right? Every time an expression, right, is expression one, operator expression two. Expression one, expression two are smaller but of the same type. So what we do is we recursively process expression 1 and expression 2, and we combine their result into something that will produce an overall result for the current expression. Right? Similar to Lego bricks. Right? Remember Lego bricks? They have some studs and some hollows, right? So the studs go into the hollows and snap together, and they uh, stick together. But the outside of the resulting thing, of the resulting b b bigger brick, also has studs and stun hollows. So it can be further combined. Right? Every time we perform a combination of these, new entity, we produce a new entity. That entity has the same studs and hollows that, can, that make it, allow it to, to, to be further combined. All right? So where, where, where is it that? It, 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 it's, at, it's, a, it's, it's on many levels. So first of all, the predicates have all this E in, E out, T in, T out, L in, L out. But the generated code has the studs and hollows, right? Because we're assuming that the result of the expression is going to be pushed on the stack. And whenever we compile a complicated expression, we focus on one operator, what does it do? Well, based on the assumption that the result of the subcomponents are on the stack, just pops from the stack, performs the operation, and pushes back on the stack. Right? Not the most efficient way, but definitely very simple and very easy to understand that it's correct. Okay? So remember, compositionality is one very important principle. It applies on many levels in programming languages, not just in semantics. Um, all right, It's part of the fact that you can take a block, put it inside another block, and create a bigger program. right? So it works at that level, too. And we're going to see in object-oriented programming a lot more types of compositionality. Now, this was the last lesson on Prolog. I'm sure very many of you who have already asked, how much more Prolog do we have? Last one. Today, last, um, last assignment on Prolog, which is going to have, uh, which is going to be based on the compiler, so you get to play a bit with it. So that's going to be the last assignment on Prolog as well. Uh, the, um, the semester break is coming, so hopefully you get a bit more time to um, uh, to play with it, right? And uh, the uh, 
by the end of uh, this is this assignment, right? Those of you who have gotten full marks uh, already reached the 35 point cap. All right. So, well, so if you're in that situation where you have, you know, gotten full marks for everything you have submitted so far, and you have submitted everything, you're pretty much done for the month. Okay. Whatever you do is for your own pleasure. Um, and I, I hope you continue to <laughs> to submit uh, solutions. Um, the PS1 is marked already. I, unfortunately, I have some trouble uh, getting the grade book to work. So if I don't manage to do it, I'm going to let you know. I'm going to just post an Excel sheet or something. But um, it's, uh, it's, it's finished already. Uh, so yeah, in jailbreak, uh, I'm going to record the Python data types uh, rest of the lecture, and I'm going to upload it in the um, in in the uh, uh, media directory. And if I'm not happy with this current recording, I'll probably do another recording offline. Hopefully, that thing gets um, fixed. So in your break, um, well, most of you I'm going to see see tomorrow anyway. But do enjoy your break. Do enjoy your homework for. See you next time. <laughs>